Jackie, um, excuse me. A little switch to a Red Sox talk here. You think Jackie Bradley Jr. will stay up with the Red Sox and play a little outfield? It's starting to look more and more that way. Sean McAdam, our Red Sox insider for CSNNE.com, uh, a couple of days ago said that he had it at about 50-50. Jackie Bradley, as we're talking now on Sunday, had a three-run home run. He keeps doing it. He's making the decision very difficult on uh, on John Farrell with, with his play batting over 400 for the majority of the spring and his defensive uh, prowess in the outfield is terrific. But what I like more than anything else is his attitude because he said he came into spring training with no expectations that he might even have a shot at making the major league ball club he just wanted to learn and we've seen that his learning curve I mean it's going straight up he has a great attitude he's played terrific but if he is to make the big club we're going to have an interesting dynamic where exactly is, is he going to play is Jacoby Ellsbury going to give up some time I don't think so what about Shane Victorino you sign him to a three-year 39 million dollar contract Johnny Gomes a little bit of a liability with the glove but the fact that David Ortiz is having some health problems with his with both feet right now um, then maybe Johnny Gomes slides into the DH and then maybe you put Jackie Bradley Jr. right there the question for him is he needs to have regular at bats and if he keeps batting like he is right now now that the pitching is actually getting better in the last week of spring training I say keep him up if it's, if it's his if it's my decision I say keep him with the big club and then if he hits a little bit of a slump send him back down and it's not going to hurt his confidence in any way you just got to keep him in a regular lineup day to day Kevin following up on that you mentioned possibly putting Jackie Bradley in for Johnny Gomes at some points. Johnny Gomes is not known to be a right, uh, he cannot hit right-handed pitchers. So do you think Jackie Bradley could go in in right field and take Johnny Gomes' spot when he is struggling? In my view, that's where he would be. I, I could see that happening. Um, and, you know, it just depends on what the defensive needs are for the game. But if it comes down to a situation where it's like a platoon, that's uh, I, I think Johnny Gomes is going to be OK with that because he's a pro's pro at this point. You know, he's, he's had a difficult life growing up with a heart attack and losing one of his best friends um, at a very young age. I think he's just happy for everything that he has. But, but the issue is with Jackie Bradley Jr., you don't want him to uh, be riding the bench and, and playing every other day because that, in the end, um, you'll start putting some rust on him. And at this point in his career, you don't want that. You want him playing all the time. It's just like a good player in the, in the NHL. Um, if he comes up, if you have him up early and he's not playing all that often, it's sometimes better to have him down in the AHL, in, in, in Bruins speak, in Providence for a while, so he's playing every day. Kevin, this morning in the Sunday Globe, Dan Shaughnessy wrote an article about the Red Sox-Yankee rivalry kind of dying almost. Mm -hmm. Do you see this rivalry dying, or do you see it coming back maybe in 2013? Um, it, it's, it's not what it was a couple of years ago, and he's right to say that. And just remember that, that Dan, he's, he's a columnist, so he can uh, be the provocateur uh, with things like that. But it, it's interesting that he would write about it because we've had some discussions among other colleagues that it, it just doesn't have quite the same juice that it once did. Um, can it come back? Sure, of course it can come back. It's just on the wane and, and has been really for the last couple of years. Kevin, do you have any early projections for the Boston Red Sox this year? Yeah, I see a 500 team, which is, uh, I know, is probably not going to make you all that happy and, and a lot of other people happy. But remember what they did last year. Um, it, it, it's going to be it's going to be an improvement to the eyeball. They're going to be a lot more exciting with Shane Victorino in the speed. If Jackie Bradley is up with the club, John Lester, Clay Buckholtz having great springs. <coughs> excuse me, with the pitching. Um, so I think it's going to be a lot better. Is it going to really be enough to get them in the wild card race? I'm not really sure. I think they're maybe a year or two away. Although I wouldn't be totally shocked if they make it into the playoff picture. I'm just not counting on it. Kevin, one last question. I know you're a big golf guy. What's your opinion on Tiger Woods' kind of resurgence almost? <laughs> well, he's picking the perfect, perfect time to do it. He started to just before the Masters and heading into the final round at Bay Hill, Arnold Palmer, the Arnold Palmer Classic. Look, he's won it seven times. I look at his game right now. For Tiger, it always comes down to the putting. And in the third round of the Bay Hill Classic, he probably had maybe one of the best putting rounds of his life. He just looks locked in. The ball is tracking. His speed is right on the greens. And, um, you know, his personal life, we know all about some of the problems that he's been through before. He just kind of looks like a guy that's uh, – that's reached a, a little bit more peace. Maybe, maybe dating Lindsey Vaughn has something to do with it. I don't know. Um, but usually when you're in love and you feel like your personal life is in order, usually your professional life kind of follows suit. All right, Kevin, thank you so much for coming on today. 
We'll see you. We'll see you around later. Thank you so All right. much. All right, guys. Thanks so much for having me. Have a great day. Yeah, you too. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to YBA's K Sports Sunday, live from the Rex Trailer Studio, Rex Trailer Boomtown Studio. I'm here with John Han. We're back, and alongside me, Benji and Tom Kelly. Right now, we're going to talk a little bit about the NFL. They recently had some rule changes. The first one being the repealing of the tuck rule. What is your reaction to this? Well, it's sad to see it go because it propelled the Patriots into their <laughs> dynasty. Yeah. The Patriots went on this remarkable run, and then after that, uh, the Raiders just went downhill as, as we take a look at uh, this game, at the Raiders-Patriots snowball game. Yeah, that was a memorable game, to oh, say yeah. the least. Oh, yeah, memorable game. <laughs> and then you'll see the, the Patriots will actually, well, of course they'd win this, but Honestly, the tuck rule was probably the only reason they won this game. It was it was insane. I was real, yeah. We were young at the time, but this game was um, right there. There's the tuck play. There it is. Charles yep. Woodson. Yeah, Charles, Charles Woodson. The yep. very play that ruined his life. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Changed the pa fate of the Patriots and brought him a few Super Bowls. Do you agree with the repealing of the tuck rule? I mean, <laughs> it's a stupid rule. Biasly, I think they should keep it just because it like <laughs> the the we're, we're, we're Pats fans. But I understand why they got rid of it. it it's not necessary. It's yeah. just, I mean, I, I'd it. agree. I, I don't think I think they should have repealed it just because it doesn't apply to any other position. Right. They're bringing yeah. the ball back in. It's getting knocked out regardless. They're not going for a pass. It's not an incomplete pass. Right. I think it should have been repealed. Benji and Tom, what do you guys think? I should. I don't think it should have been a rule to, to begin with. As you guys said, it's unnecessary. It's just, it's a dumb rule. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with you. It's almost like, it's like a, almost a once in a blue moon situation where someone does that. Like, it really, it's kind of a rare thing. And have these crazy rules that, like, only happen if this and this happen. It's almost not necessary. And it altered the course of a franchise. By Oakland right. The one rule altered the course of an entire franchise. It's... This. Interesting. Controversial. I mean, let's say the Raiders also did make some bad picks along the okay. way. So okay. Jamarcus Russell didn't help him out anyway. But. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> so the other rule they changed was that running backs and offensive players cannot lead with their helmet. They can't lead with their helmet to push defensive players. And often they have offensive player safety rules come into concern. But right now in the spotlight is a defensive player safety rule. What do you, what do you think about this rule change? Yeah, I heard Teddy Bruschi talk about this on SportsCenter the other day. And I found it really interesting what he said was that defensive players have to deal with these offensive player safety rules. And now the, de and now the offensive players have to deal with defensive player True. safety rules. Exactly. So I, I thought that was an interesting take on it is now that the coin, the coin is almost flipped. It, it's, it's changed on them. And once again, it's going to be kind of like the tuck rule in, in the way that it's not going to be called a whole lot. Yep. You're not going to see this call a whole lot. Exactly. So because it is subjective. Right, exactly. And I don't think it's, it's going to be tough to see in real time, I think, for the refs. So I don't think this rule will affect the game too much. But then again, we never know. It could come in the last quarter of a game and a ref throws that flag for mm -hmm. this type of rule. True. You never know. And I remember going back to the this year's AFC Championship when Stephen Ridley was injured by the Patriot killer <laughs> Bernard Pollard. Stephen Ridley did put his head down and go into that hit to Pollard. I do think it was a cheap hit by Pollard. But in this case, that could have been a penalty on Steven Ridley. Tom and Benji, do you guys have a strong opinion either way? Well, you know, as you guys said, this will not be called a whole lot, but mm -hmm. take this into consideration. In 10 years, there might be an individual handbook for every position in the National <laughs> Football League. I yeah. mean, come on. It's getting pretty ridiculous. I mean, rugby players are taught how to tackle. They don't need rules to tell them not to. Yeah. I mean, I kind of, I'm, I'm kind of in favor of this. I think it's to protect the safety of these running backs, running backs, and have longer careers and play football, which they seem to like doing it. And I think it also it just makes the makes the defensive players they could possibly get hurt on a hit to the head if like if I take my head and run it into someone's ribs, I could possibly hurt themselves. So I think this rule is a good mm -hmm. idea, but it shouldn't be called a lot. Now NFL players have already expressed have already expressed. Um, their feelings against this rule. <laughs> Matt Forte tweeted, guess I'll be getting my fine money ready. So it looks like Matt Forte will sort of be sticking it to the man there in uh, Roger Goodell. Right now, we'll move on to some World Baseball Classic talk. Uh, in my opinion, it's a topic that does not get nearly enough coverage, not coverage, but appreciation in the United States because other countries have this 
sort of a, a World Cup vibe to it. They, this is their country's pride with this. But in the United States, you'll have players, nah, I'll pass it. I think I might get injured. I'll be representing my country in our country's oldest sport, but eh, I might get injured.